of our opening hymn, 651, I Love Your Kingdom, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered here this day to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and in praise and to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. But together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. We do pause for a moment of silent reflection and remembrance of our sin before God, our Holy Lord. The good news this day for you is that Almighty God in his mercy has given his only son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As I called an ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. 
Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, that receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may please be seated. The Old Testament reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 7. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among, among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? 
If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What an incredible passage. We rise as we hear the verse of the Alleluia and verse. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. This will serve as the basis for the sermon meditation this week. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said, to, they said to him, yes. And he said to them, Therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house, who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let's join together in confessing our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the office hymn. It's hymn 533, Jesus Has Come and Brings Pleasure.
Dear fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, may that grace, mercy, and peace of your Savior be yours in his name. Amen. Hearing again those words from St. Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. This is our text. To be or to rule or to act like a king, and not just any king, but the king. That, dear friends, is the purpose of the parables. That's the heart of the parables. God's gracious rule as king. We hear those words. The kingdom of heaven is like. We get these pictures from Jesus about what the kingdom of heaven is like, and sometimes as we hear the parables and these pictures, it just doesn't make sense, does it? Who lives like that? Who farms like that? What kind of king rules like that? Matthew 13. A beautiful field of wheat produces an embarrassing crop of weeds. They don't belong there. But the farmer doesn't immediately pull them and root them up right away. Matthew 13. What kind of farmer recklessly scatters seed, precious seed? In Matthew 13. What kind of investor doesn't diversify his portfolio? He sticks all of his chips on the chance at one pearl in the hopes of buying one field. We would say that's foolish. That's nuts. Who invests like that? You think you know, but you don't. That's the point of the parables. Those little stories with big meanings are given to us so that Jesus can reveal himself and his Father to us in ways that we wouldn't expect or even understand on our own. Really, the point of the parables is to get you to think of something else. So what is the kingdom of God truly about? Sometimes not what you expected. Not about your rule. It's not about your ways or how you would have done things. The subject of the verb is always God, the king. The coming of the kingdom is pictured as defenselessness. Fish are captured in a net. The good are sorted and kept, but the bad fish are thrown out, chopped up, and thrown into the garden as fertilizer. The kingdom of God comes in loneliness and in secrecy. You never know where God's word is working, do you? It's hidden from you. It's like seed that grows while you're sleeping and while you're away. You never know what effect it's going to have in the good soil. It was just yesterday that I got to have lunch with a friend, a colleague, a brother pastor who's now serving in Europe. He's in Latvia. He was here and he had lunch with me. We're at the hilltop and we were talking. And he's telling me about the work of the gospel overseas. He's telling me about a, pa a, a person who's in Nepal. Of all places, this person is the son of, a, of, a, of a, a community. He's the son of a leader in that community. The leader died, and the leader was Islam. He was Muslim, believed in the Islam faith, and the son was given the seed of the gospel. The son did not follow his father's footsteps, but he, he became Christian. And because he's a spiritual leader of this community, everyone in the community is following him and his lead. And you know what? He's getting his theology from YouTube. He's going online and he's getting Lutheran doctrine and teaching from our pastors here, and he's bringing it to his community there. And the whole community is following his lead because he's their spiritual leader and they're looking up to him. You never know where the word of God is working. All are subject to this kingdom of God, this kingdom of God that seems tiny, it seems overlooked by the great powers of our world, insignificant, like a tiny seed or just a little bit of yeast in a batch of 10 gallons. 
You never know. Don't think that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is a person. It's not. It's not a place. The kingdom of God is not a movement or a social construct. No, a good way to understand the kingdom of God is it's an activity. It's what God is doing in Christ Jesus to seek and to save the lost. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is like, that phrase can also mean, don't you know, Yadar, hey, the kingdom of heaven is like God. Through his only son, reclaiming the world which was once his, lost through sin, but now being redeemed and restored. Like a seed, God's kingdom will have a small beginning in human eyes. It will seem weak and useless and powerless. But Jesus, we know, doesn't use military power. He doesn't use political or social powers to bring about his kingdom. He reclaims the world through tiny ways, like seed that's preached. He uses small, insignificant things, like his birth at Bethlehem, or a cross that seems not to have much value to the world at all, but an instrument of torture and death. But yet this word, as it is preached, encounters opposition at every level, at every turn, but even despite that opposition, this preaching bears an abundant harvest. How does the Son of God win the world back to his Father? What is it like when God comes down into the world in Jesus to be king, to rule and to reign in his stead? What is the reign of heaven like? It's God's reign and what he is doing in Jesus. It's like when a man sells all that he has to buy a field, a newly discovered treasure. It's like a merchant finally finding the most precious pearl. And what in the parable stops that man from accomplishing his goals? What stops him from sacrificing all he owns to make the treasure his? Nothing. The bigger question is, what did he give up in order to get that treasure? What did he give up in order to buy the field, finally to own it for himself for all time with great joy? There was nothing that could stop the king from reigning. It doesn't make sense, does it? That the king should have to give up everything in order to make the treasure his own. But that's how the king reigns. Dear friends, that's how the king reigns over you because you are that treasure. Ask yourselves, would God the Father really give up his only son and have him sacrificed on a cross so that he could buy the world back and have you as his treasure? Well, let the parable be the answer to that question for you. See the determination of the one who brings the kingdom of God for you. It's not in a way that you would expect. It's not your doing. It's the doing of God for you. If you've seen the movie, you would know the scene. In Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, you have one iconic scene in that movie. It's a pretty graphic movie about the life, death, trial, suffering of Jesus Christ. It's world-renowned, of course, the movie is. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to do so. <clears throat> but in that movie, there is one iconic scene where Jesus is stretched out on the cross and he's looking over and he sees a soldier nailing the spike into his hand. Come to find out that in the production of that movie, it's the director's own hand that is doing the nailing. You want to know if God really loves you? Just know that you were the treasure that Jesus st stopped at nothing to get. For that's how the king rules. He purchased and bought you back, not with silver or gold, but with his holy, precious blood and innocent suffering and death. Let that be the answer to the question, would he really do that for me? That's how the king rules. It's God's reign and Jesus is bringing it for you. Now, St. Paul, I've seen what you've been up to. I've seen you've taken a play from the playbook of the merchant in search of fine pearls. 
You've patterned your dealings after the man who risked it all to get what his heart longed for. No, St. Paul, you didn't buy a field, but you built a classroom. That action may be counted by some as tiny, foolish, and unwise in our use of resources. And if it wasn't enough, you put the coop and the chickens and the nest right in the basket with the eggs, and you said, we want to buy the house as well. And so you bought the Center Street property. A family, I would have you know, from 13 hours away is going to be moving into that property this weekend. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. You did what you did, St. Paul, for the sake of the gospel, that more may get the seed planted, that it may grow to a harvest for the kingdom. You never know what it will have produced. You did what you did because Jesus did what he did. He emptied himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And knowing that God so loved the world, you are in the business of pointing people to Jesus. So dear family, in a world full of discouragement, and there's a lot of it, and you will face it, and it is coming, be encouraged that God bought you, bought you back from sin, death, and the devil, putting everything to one purpose. He bought the whole field with you in it. When the discouragement comes, and it will, let this encourage you. In claiming you as his very own, it is there that God determined your worth and your value. Your value is not determined by your status, not by the account numbers that you have in your bank account. He is not determined by how nice of a car you drive or how early you retired or how you look physically. No, friends, you are of great value in God's sight because he gave it all for you. He risked it all so that you would know every day with certainty these three things. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are perfect in Christ Jesus. Wait, me? Yeah, you. That's why it's called Amazing Grace, because Jesus sought, found, and bought you. And from the cross with his last breath, he cried out, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit, because you were worth that to God. May that encourage you. The reign of the risen Jesus goes on because God raised his son from the dead. May this king and his love reign always in your life. Be encouraged this day. Be encouraged by his invitation to come to his table today, to receive what looks ordinary, insignificant, and overlooked. That in simple bread and simple wine, Jesus encourages you. He reminds you of his reign and his rule over you, over sin, over Satan. And let it nourish you in your identity as his pearl. Come and be encouraged in this way, overlooked and unlikely. For you are that treasured possession. In Jesus, it is so now and always. May this king rule your heart and life this day and always. Amen. And now may that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds and our lives in Christ Jesus, our King. Amen. I invite you to please rise and stand as we join in the prayer of the church. God has chosen us to be his treasured possession and has given his son to die for us. Let us go to him with all our concerns. We pray for the church around the world that lay and clergy members alike seek to reveal the invisible treasure of God's love in Christ. For all who seek value in themselves, that they discover God's great love for them. And for all those who will face God's judgment at the end of the age, that they realize the forgiveness he offers in Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the leaders of the world's nations, 
that they seek to relieve, relieve conflict and ensure justice for farmers and ranchers that they look for ways that feed us all while caring for God's good earth, for all who go into harm's way in our communities and across the globe, and for all who work to meet the needs of those who are sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Guide, strengthen, and protect them all. Heavenly Father, for those near and dear to us in our various crises of health and long-term ills, the victims of flood or fires or quakes, and those who do not know where to turn, let us pray to the Lord. Visit, sustain, and open doors of healing and peace according to your gracious will, O God. Above all, we pray for ourselves, parents, and children, singles and couples, young and old, that we strengthen one another in faith and love, in strength and confidence amid the conflicts and turmoil of this world, that God's love and grace be evident in how we care for one another. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear our prayer, Heavenly Father, for we call to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good right and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestowed on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we long to magnify your glorious name evermore, praising you and singing. O gracious Father, hear us as we pray in your Son's name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, do in remembrance of me. Dear friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be with you always.
We rise. Jesus gave it all. The Father said, go, and he bought the field. He gave his life for you. And now may this precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, may it strengthen you, preserve you, keep you in that true faith, and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. We pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us once again through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We join in hymn 643.